good. Pleased to uh, introduce Sean McGlynn, whose works will be known, I know, to many in the audience for interesting book on violence in medieval war, but also on the campaigns around uh, Magna Carta and the invasion uh, by the French in 1216. And he's going to use his sort of expertise in the sort of contextualization of violence in medieval warfare to focus particularly on um, an event that has gone down, particularly in modern years, as making him a fifth of war criminal. There are literary specialists who've written articles about whether Henry V was a war criminal. There have even been trials of Henry V, rather like the have been of Richard III uh, uh, in America there. And uh, he's going to talk to us uh, today about the, the, the killing of the prisoners at the Battle of Argentina. Yeah, sorry, this is going to be a bit of a downer after all the enjoyable <laughs> things we've had previously. <clears throat> Chivalry was embodied in the person of the knight, the elite soldier of medieval warfare. The stereotypical image of the knight is of an armoured horseman holding fast to values of bravery, mercy and loyalty, and he was ready to lay down his life defending the faith, children and women, especially beautiful women. When he is described as chivalrous, the, the adjective is readily understood and sums up the goodness and the nobility of the knight's character. As a stereotypical image, it is somewhat flawed. Undoubtedly, there were some very puffy, gentle knights in the Chaucerian mode, but these were probably given a hard time by their more robust and thick-skinned peers on the military training ground. Huge resources of time, money and equipment were invested in knights, not so that they could merely become refined and devout gentlemanly officers, but to render them efficient killing machines. After the no-quarter policies of the Dark Ages, chivalry evolved and was to create a new rule book in the wars of Christendom in later medieval Europe. Chivalry, in conjunction with the church, did play a part in ending wars as a slave hunt uh, and in sparing some prisoners. The knightly warrior class, as a result, became increasingly exempt from atrocity. As Matthew Strickland has written, this emphasis on capture as opposed to slaying stands in stark contrast, cross, sorry, stark contrast to Saxon and Viking conduct in regard to enemy warriors. In 1066, the Normans brought with them to England the chivalrous practices of the continent. But this was not the chivalry, of course, of Ivanhoe and the romanticised images of the Victorian era. John Gillingham has defined chivalry as, I quote, a code in which a key element was the attempt to limit the brutality of conflict by treating prisoners, at any rate when they were men of gentle birth, in a relatively humane fashion. He suggests that the compassionate treatment of defeated high-status enemies is a defining characteristic of chivalry and entirely compatible with a very different treatment being meted out to people regarded as low status, the poor bloody infantry and all the rest. Chivalry, then, was little more than an insurance policy for the fighting upper classes, who paid their premiums by the acquisition of the expensive arms, armour, and most of all, war horses that signified the elite warrior figure of the knight. The motivation for a code of chivalry was self-preservation. Ransoming made it work. A live, wealthy prisoner was worth more to the captor than a dead one although there are reports of chronicles of corpses being ransomed at half the going rate of a live prisoner. <laughs> Large, sometimes huge and ruinous sums could be extorted from a captive's family to secure the return of a prisoner. The principle applied to the greatest in the land, hence the term King's Ransom, as for Richard the Lionheart or uh, King John um, after Poitiers. Chivalry could trickle down to a bargain basement pound shop level, I suppose, for the lower ordin orders, as ordinary foot soldiers ransomed lesser folk. But the prospect of ransom did not ensure the well-being of a captive, as examples from the Hundred Years' War reveal. Jean Le Gastelier's job in Robert Chesnall's military contingent was to beat their prisoners to extract promises from them of the largest possible ransom. Uh, one Francois de la Palou imprisoned Henry Jontien in a dungeon, and as one historian describes... Francois had sent a letter to the Duke of Bourbon and others amongst Henry's connections, warning them that if he was not paid promptly, he would pull Henry's, teeth, pull Henry's teeth out. When they did not respond, he knocked out a few with his hammer and circulated them to show that he meant what he said. <laughs> so not very chivalrous there. 
Ransoming developed into a burgeoning business as warfare opened up this new economic opportunity to be exploited. Eventually, the whole process of ransoming accrued legal codes and structures, as Romeo Buell has uh, studied recently, and many cases came to be settled in the court of chivalry. As Paul Hyams has neatly summed up in this new chivalry in warfare, I quote, Previously, accepted dogma had held that it was both prudent and legitimate to deal with defeated enemies by simply killing them. The newer view preferred to spare noble lives in return for a fat ransom. This was in part a declaration of knightly labour union rules. It was comforting to know, as one rode off into battle, that you and your gentle peers were not expected to go so far as killing each other, that you merely competed for the twin prizes of knightly valour and earthly swag. Victory now brought applause and enrichment without too much of a risk of death. Obviously, things were different at Agincourt. On many occasions, these seemingly cast-iron guarantees for prisoners were simply ignored. One such occasion was the great chivalrous victory of Henry V at Agincourt in 1415. Now, I won't go through the battle because that's been uh, dealt with in detail, but just to say, after the first catastrophic wave of attack, the French, packed together, were pushed back onto their second line, the weight of numbers pressing the second division further back as the route continued. Uh, but it was, it was at this commanding juncture that the impending English victory was threatened with defeat. There was a lull in the fighting which seemed to mark the end of the battle and English success. French survivors, often pulled out from under corpses, <coughs> were taken captive. The number of prisoners is uncertain. Some figures suggest as high as between 1,400 and 2,000 men, uh, which is very high, if, if the case, I'm not so sure. Whatever the actual figure, all sources agree that it was definitely a very large number. There is some dispute as to what happened next. There was naturally much French activity on the battlefield's far periphery, where many French remained. At some point, a cry had gone up that the English baggage train at the rear was under attack. It is not clear who exactly led this attack, but chroniclers uh, settled on the leader, its leader as the local lord of Agincourt. Nor is it clear at what point of the battle the assault on the camp took place. It may even ha have occurred at the very beginning of the battle. Some sources claim that it was this event that precipitated the massacre of prisoners. But given the uncertainty of its timing, another even more pressing development provides perhaps a more telling reason. It was feared that the French 3rd Division was grouping for a major counterattack. A cavalry charge of some 600 men at arms was about to be launched, or so it seemed. This counterattack was a mortal threat to the English. Fatigued and no longer in tight formation on the battlefield, they were extremely vulnerable to a fresh attack. And if the assault on the camp had synchronised with the cavalry charge, the danger was doubled. At this point of pivotal jeopardy, Henry ordered all but the most important prisoners to be massacred. His knights refused the order. This was partly out of chivalrous and moral concerns, but mainly out of self-interest. The prisoners represented a huge fortune in ransom money, and thus an opportunity for enormous financial profit. A third reason for the order being refused, um, I think, is that, um, it, that this other consideration must be taken into account, and that's this. If the English were to be captured afterwards by the French, either before or reaching Calais, they would uh, likely suffer the same fate. And we have already heard this morning of retaliatory cycles with Chris uh, Ford's paper. Henry was not to be deterred by this act of insubordination. Instead, he relayed his urgent instructions to a squire and 200 archers, and any who refused to carry out the order were themselves to be immediately executed. Not that they would have been as reluctant as the knights to carry out the executions, if defeat, their fate was likely to be the same with or without the killing of the French prisoners. The archers set about their grisly business. Men at arms who had surrendered themselves to their captors on guarantee of their safety were massacred. Most of the victims had their throat cuts, throats cut, some were herded into a barn and burnt, according to one source, and a French chronicle wrote that the victims were decapitated and inhumanely mutilated. The accepted explanation for the Asian Corps atrocity is straightforward. Henry's immediate concern was the prisoners disarmed and dishelmed, but still in their plate armour, and more rested than those still had they'd just been engaged in the combat, uh, they might break free, overwhelm the guards, pick up the weapons that lay on the field, and assist the counterattack. 
Um, and all this at a time when Henry needed every possible man for the expected renewal of combat in the field. And this has been concern of our previous medieval commanders, commanders in earlier time when dealing with prisoners. This was a real concern then. Some contemporaries from both sides make the danger posed by these prisoners explicitly clear. The deeds of Henry V relates, A shout went up that the enemy's mounted rearguard, incomparable in number and still fresh, were re-establishing their position and line of battle in order to launch an attack on us, few and weary as we were. And immediately, regardless of distinction of person, the prisoners, save for the Dukes of Orléans and Bourbon, certain other illust illustrious men, and a very few others, were killed by the swords, either of their captors or of others, others following after, lest they should involve us in utter disaster in the fighting that would ensue. Contemporaries John Harding and Thomas Elman confirm the view, the latter stating, quote, Many new battle lines threatened to enter the fray to fight against the weary. The English killed the French they had taken prisoner for the sake of protecting the rear. Some French sources believe that the knights Henry thought were about to attack him were actually leave, leaving the field uh, and blame this manoeuvre on the massacre. Some historians can overlook or make insufficient connections between the two facts that lead, lend support to this argument at Agincourt. The first was that Henry had already considered the problem of prisoners. The night before the battle, he had actually released all the prisoners he had brought with him on the much more Harfleur and whom he was taking to England for ransom. The French promised to return to their English captors if their army lost the battle. By doing this, he was clearly not only freeing up his own men for fighting, but also avoiding the danger of prisoners becoming combatants in the heat of battle. Secondly, the luster of chivalry was frequently an illusion. Prisoners who gave their word, parole, often broke it. As uh, cited above, the deeds of Henry V reports that some nobles surrendered themselves more than ten times. Uh, this can be interpreted in different ways, some more lenient than others. One is that the prisoner became somehow separated from the captain in the heat of battle and so gave himself up to another knight, English knight for protection. Or, more likely, probably, the prisoner escaped into confusion only to find it necessary to protect himself soon afterwards by surrendering again. Certainly, a knight's oath was only as sacred as he felt it to be. In the early 13th century, France's flower of chivalry and, England's, and, and France's answer to England's renowned William the Marshal, the best knight in the world, uh, was a chap called William de Barr. And on at least two occasions, he broke his parole to escape, being held prisoner. What's truly remarkable about Agincourt, though, is that the men Henry had released on the eve of battle held true to their word and fulfilled their promise by later returning to him. So concern for the security of the French prisoners and keeping them as non-combatants was a genuine problem and one that had Henry had already considered, as we might expect with someone um, of his uh, forethinking. But this explanation can serve only up to a point. Um, Christopher Almond, in his magisterial biography of Henry, raises these difficulties and questions the scale of the slaughter. Would so many men, still in armour, offer no sustained resistance to being murdered? How could Henry afford the men for the task? Was it because they had too few arrows left to shoot at the cavalry? And if so, uh, one could ask why they, it was the men at arms who were given the initial orders instead of the archers in the first place. The number killed is also difficult to ascertain. Henry returned to England with over a thousand prisoners, so how many were actually slain at Agincourt? Uh, most relevant of all, with up to it, maybe as many as 2,000 prisoners, but possibly not as much, how would Henry have expected them all to be killed in a short time before the imminent cavalry charge by a number um, uh, much larger than them? As John Keegan has noted, the mechanics of such a gruesome task would have entailed a lengthy process. He judicially infers that the number of victims was in the low hundreds, if that. The impracticalities of this battlefield slaughter, so unlike the post-battle battle massacres of, say, Acre, Hatting, Wexford, posed the question of what were the most substantive reasons behind Henry's orders. We might consider the lesson of terror in medieval warfare here. Henry ensured that the French 3rd Division, that was grouping for what he thought was believed was a charge, that they could actually see the executions taking place. He was warning them, not only would their charge put his other prisoners, their comrades, in deadly peril, but also that they could expect the same treatment if they too fell into English hands. As a matter of clear-headed urgency, 
He even sent a herald to the French to relay this message explicitly to them. Some of the sources openly attribute the killings to this purpose. Titus Livius writes that the English, I quote, feared that they might have to fight another battle against both the prisoners and the enemy. <coughs> so they put many to death, including many rich and noble men. Meanwhile, the most prudent king sent heralds to the French of the new army, asking whether they would come to fight or would leave the field, informing them that if they did not withdraw, or if they came to battle, all of the prisoners and any of them who might be captured would all be killed by the sword with no mercy. He informed them of this. They, fearing the English and fearing for themselves, departed with great sadness at their shame. Other chronicles corroborate this. Um, the Brute Chronicle writing, Afterwards, news came to the king that there was a new battle Frenchman drawn up, ready to steal upon them and come towards them. Immediately, the king had it proclaimed that every man should kill the prisoners he had taken. When they, the French, saw that our men were killing the prisoners, they withdrew and broke up their battle line and their whole army. That Henry immediately brought the massacre to an end when he saw the French retreat is confirmed by a French chronicler. Both sources quoted above attest that it was at this stage that victory was finally claimed and celebrated. Henry's brutal tactic had worked. Victory vindicated his ruthless actions. The crucial explanation for the killings lies, perhaps, in the fact that for Henry, the battle was not conclusively over. Enemy activity convinced him that victory could easily be turned into defeat. At this juncture, his prisoners, though technically non-combatants, were, as conventional opinion rightly points out, potentially a real threat to Henry. But what is perhaps overlooked is that they also constituted a powerful weapon for him. In threatening to kill them and in, seen, in being seen to carry out his threat, Henry, being a highly capable, hard-hearted military commander, was turning a weakness into a strength. The power of this weapon was, so, was too great for the enemy and ensured Henry's complete triumph at Agincourt. So let's just take it out a little bit further and get some other comparisons with uh, 15th century massacres. And we come to England now in the Wars of the Roses. During the Wars of the Roses, pe previously quite relatively peaceful England saw an upsurge in the killing of high-ranking prisoners. The case of Agincourt exposes the fine line between battlefield exigency and calculated murder. This fine line has been revealed in archaeological evidence for the Battle of Towton in 1461, the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil, which ended with an infamous rout. Um, when the um, funding body asked me to you know, give an evaluation of this dig, I thought, yes, that sounds like a good idea. But no one had any inkling of what the spectacular results that would be found. The analysis of skeletons from the burial pits has led to speculation, and it's, it is speculation, that the rout was not the cause of most of the deaths, but a post-battle execution of prisoners. Fought in March 1461, the battle proved to be the decisive engagement during the first phase of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, Wars of the Roses, sorry. A closely contested battle was transformed into one-sided slaughter of Edward IV's Lancastrian foes. Those escaping to York were pursued, and many were cut down in the streets, long after the battle itself was over. One chronicler informs us that 42 Lancastrian knights were rounded up and executed, with decap decapitation as the usual means of dispatch. The grave pits record the wounds inflicted on the soldiers' skeletons. The majority of possible fatal wounds appeared on heads, necks and shoulders, with the blows coming predominantly from behind. The preponderance of such blows, especially to their head, one skull received eight blows on the battlefield, would indicate that the victims were without helmets, like the massacred prisoners at Agincourt, adding to the conjecture that these soldiers had been executed. The fog of war was commonly exploited to shroud questionable acts which would later be recounted as a consequence of glorious victory. At Tewkesbury in 1471, Edward, Prince of Wales, met his end. During the last phase of the battle, Prince Edward of Lancaster, the contender for the throne, was killed. Accounts tell of how he requested quarter in vain. The Crowland Chronicler claims that he and other Lancastrian leaders were deliberately struck down and eliminated at the first opportunity. It is uncertain how he died, although contemporary sources suggest he was struck down while he was fleeing the battle and crying for assistance from his brother-in-law, fighting on the king's side. Edward's death meant, quite literally at a stroke, the end of the direct Lancastrian line and immediate removal of the threat to Edward's fourth throne. This lessening threat was diminished even further by the notorious post-battle executions when prisoners were taken out of Tewkesbury Abbey. 
We see similar mo- motivations at the Battle of Shrewsbury on July, uh, 21st of July 1403, in which Henry participated as prince. Here the usurper king Henry IV was fe- facing a rebel army headed by Sir Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, Hotspur. Any vestiges of chivalric notions were discarded even before the battle had begun. As Alistair Dunn has noted, at Shrewsbury, the objective of each side was nothing short of the annihilation of the enemy, and, if possible, that of as many of his kin and supporters as could be ridden down and slain. High rank and evidence did not guarantee safety on that bloody day. On the loyalist side, Sir Walter Blount, the King's standard bearer, and the Earl of Stafford and his knightly retinue were all cut down. Inflicting such losses only made matters worse for the rebels when they lost. The illustrious Thomas Percy, Earl of Worcester, pleaded for his life, but was immediately beheaded. When asked what should be the fate of the rebel prisoners after the battle, the loyalist general, Sir John Stanley, instructed his troops in rasping tones, burn and slay, burn and slay. The arrow stuck in his throat at the time did not predispose him towards clemency, uh, but nor had the significant losses suffered by his own army. Uh, and the role of vengeance in, in, in medieval military atrocity should not be ignored. Uh, here, nearly 1,500 bodies were found in the rebel burial pit. The closeness in time of battlefield slaughter and contiguous execution of prisoners, while the dust of combat was still settling, may serve to blur the distinction between the two separate events. The bloodlust of battle could still be coldly directed towards killings of prisoners after the fighting had ceased. And of course, as I say, the young 16-year-old Henry fought at Shrewsbury and was wounded by an arrow in the face at the time, and maybe he learnt some lessons here that he uh, took on to Agincourt in 1415. So just to wrap up now. The killing of high-ranking prisoners was still the exception to the norm in medieval warfare, but it became increasingly less so in England since the disastrous reign of Edward II, and I think Andy King will be talking about this on Monday, from whose time political motivation and justification were merged within the military context. Infantry prisoners, being the non chivalric element, were always prone to massacre and harm. When a foot soldier escaped death at the hand of his captors, he, he may not have necessarily avoided terrible punishment. During the Abbot Crusade in 1228, the Count of Toulouse ambushed a large French force, force and um, I quote from the Chronicle, after the prisoners had all been stripped to the skin, the Count ordered the eyes of some to be torn out, the ears and noses of others to be slit, and the feet and hands of others to be cut off. And thus shamefully mutilating them, he sent them to their homes, a deformed spectacle to their fellow Frenchmen. Such actions, like mass killings, were practical demonstrations that served as a warning to the enemy to deflate its morale, hinder recruitment, and simply to reduce by physical means the manpower available for fighting. However, as the Middle Ages moved into its later stages, mutilations were not quite so common as girl mortal, mortal war increased in frequency and fewer prisoners were taken quite so readily, um, especially not until the battle uh, was safety won, uh, such as we've seen with Henry's problems at Agincourt. And this problem is highlighted in Geoffrey de Charny's mid-14th century book on chivalry, saying about, you know, uh, don't take prisoners until the battle is over, otherwise, like looking for plunder or booty on the battlefield, your forces will become disorganised and you're just subject to, uh, uh, vulnerable to a counterattack. The Azure Corps is, was not um, unique in many ways. Um, it's the most famous. In just one month of Henry's reign in January 1420, the English massacred a large force of Armagnacs uh, retreating under safe conduct, while the bastard of Alençon uh, massacred his numerous English prisoners at La Rochelle. And it wasn't new even by this time. In 1373 at Deval, the commanders of two opposing forces could not come to terms over prisoner exchange, so they both simply slayed their, their captives, uh, for want of a better idea. So, um, chivalric treatment of high ranking prisoners, lords, princes, kings, was common and is well documented. Medium ranking prisoners, even though knights, might be lucky and they might not. Shackled to the walls in dark cells with rats and vermin, and there's plenty of accounts of um, high, high ranking prisoners suffering these conditions, um, and fed with little amounts of poor food and regularly abused. Uh, was a fate that befell many that survived prisoner massacres on the battlefield or at sieges. Chivalry was fine as far as it went, but that was not very far. It was quickly and readily a victim of the military imperative of war, as Henry decisively demonstrated at Agincourt. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. Again, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, 
I'm, I'm just going to the top. I'm not running off. Ah! <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I'm just going to get nervous. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the Sorry, I can't hear you very well. It's just uh, to draw attention just to uh, an end of it. So about the number of prisoners and the quality of the prisoners which survive is quite interesting to see the, the surviving bonds of ransoms of uh, around 100 bonds or more, about 150 prisoners which do survive. It's quite interesting for our gene codes and it's quite unique for to have that kind of surviving material. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it, should have been, it should have disappeared, but did this bonds were never paid so they survived and they give a glimpse at uh, what kind of prisoners survived and it's quite interesting to see for Ajinko that uh, there is uh, also the lower ranking of French soldiers so we, can, we, have, we don't have all the status of the prisoners but we have the amount of the ransom and we can see that they are very low amount of ransom if you put that together it reflects a bit the, the, the hierarchy that you have in the army, a, a large amount have a really small ransom, and then you have a smaller part which have a big ransom. It's quite interesting to see that it, how the massacre took place and, uh, and to, to what extent there was a selection of the, uh, the lower ranking or it was targeted to the higher ranking. It's quite interesting to see the survival of a lot of the lower ranking prisoners. Oh, yes, I mean, it's interesting, you, you make a decision on the battlefield at the time under the most uh, urgent of circumstances. Uh, a lot of, you know, things would get, some high-ranking prisoners were probably killed when they shouldn't have been, um, where others would get away. It's a, it's a matter of how much time Henry had to, to kill the prisoners. But you're right, the, the fraction of ransom is an indication of status. And you will find, in, um, going back in the early medieval period as well, uh, it, it ref you know, the, the status of the prisoner is reflected. And it might be a, uh, a non combatant prisoner, civilians, especially in the Hundred Years' War. Ordinary people could be ransomed. Uh, Philip Contravine has his famous examples of the poor peasant in Normandy. The French army moved through, uh, captured him, and he's ransomed. Then the, he, the English army moved through, captured him, and then he's ransomed again. So there's, there is a very specific um, or, or very clear idea of what the scales of ransom should be. And it does allow lower status prisoners to ransom their own lower status prisoners as well, right down to you know, the infantry as well. But this is a very good point about the status, yes. Just a couple of minutes on the subject of uh, ransom. <clears throat> Were the rates of ransom fairly well laid down, or, or could it be a supply and demand thing? If you came up with it, if you were lucky in one of the you know, loads of high status prisoners, could their value go down as well? That's a good question. Um, I don't know for the Hundred Years' War, our people know better, far better than me. But certainly after the Battle of Hattin, um, when the Muslim army took loads of uh, crusaders as prisoners, um, they were saying, you know, you could have a string of them, you know, ten of them on a string or on a chain, go for the price of a loaf of bread and a shoe or something like that. You know, so the price did drop to reflect the fact that there were so many prisoners that the value ha had dropped. Um, it's going to be different, with, obviously, with the higher ranking prisoners are always going to be much more expensive. You know, have a demand a higher price. Yeah, the case of Marshal Boucicot is an, an interesting one because he never actually was ransomed. Was the, that seems to be incredibly poor business. Is that what they were asking too much? Because he did die some years afterwards. It wasn't immediately after. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the individual prisoners now and others. Or but he was second in command, uh, notionally, on the day, albeit him and uh, yeah, Dalbrecht ordered you've got all the red. Bear in mind that Agincourt isn't a decisive battle. It's good to have Peter talking about Poitiers because it was the French king was captured. Mm -hmm. Nobody that important was captured at Agincourt. Nobody but the French king had an incentive to get back again. And so, in a way, I mean, they, they appointed another constable and marshal. So, Marshal Boussico just sort of wallowed in England. And Henry saw this as a political situation as well and of course was trying to persuade these French prisoners to accept his claim to the French throne. So it's actually complicated. I don't know whether anybody wants to yeah, say any more just, about uh, this. Yeah, uh, died uh, quite shortly after. So a lot, lot of prisoners uh, were a bit higher, stayed mm -hmm. a longer time for the political reason, pressure uh, maybe on Burgundy. Uh, but Boussico, I think, an amount of ransom at some point was set, but he died. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 it can be quite convenient sometimes.
Yes, uh, absolutely. It wasn't uncommon for people to be ransomed more than once. But I fear we must stop there uh, because we want to go on and hear about another English.